So how do you scale a sales app and how soon? Why? How will you know? What's it like? What do you run into? What's likely to be the real problem? And like, how much traffic can I handle? How slow can it be? How many engineers can collaborate in the same app, same repo, same server? What does scale even mean? So, hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I am the creator and benevolent dictator for life of sales. And we have a lot to cover. And I want to keep this first talk in SalesConf 2023 pretty short. Uh, so let's skip the intro and uh, the story this time. Since we have a bunch of great talks coming up, I'll just kind of walk through who these folks are and, and what you can expect from the rest of the conference, which by the way, welcome. So Luciano is, is next after my talk and, and he's gonna be talking about lambdas and prod. Um, and he's the author of a Node.js book that's gotten pretty popular at this point actually. Uh, and he's also the Node.js architect for Four Theorem. Justin uh, is the creator of FormKit for Vue.js, and he's going to talk about a different way to build forms um, that can be easier and uh, a little bit higher level. And Natalia is going to talk about WebAssembly, and she's a leader at Microsoft doing cool stuff with open source. Donald is going to talk about building your own CLI. Um, Kelvin, who you may already know, is uh, the creator of SalesCast, the maintainer of the SalesCast community, and he's also the organizer of SalesConf. And he's going to be talking about something I'm super stoked about, which is the boring stack. And Mateo is a lead maintainer of Fastify, a very popular node framework similar to Express, um, possibly a little bit lighter weight um, and legendarily fast um, for folks who, who really need that performance. And he is also a Node.js Technical Steering Committee member. Um, and he's the founder and CTO of Platformatic, um, which is sort of like this megazord for microservices that makes it easier to, to work with microservices. Um, so he's going to be talking about that and how to use it to build APIs. So a lot of you know what sales is, but um, some of you may be here for other talks that aren't even directly about sales at all, right? Like Mateo's talk. And so I'll just do a really quick explanation of what is sales. Um, so sales is a lightweight framework, which Mateo will think that uh, there's different definitions of lightweight, but sales is a lightweight framework that sits on top of Express. Um, it's a ensemble of small modules uh, called hooks that work together to provide a easier way to build apps um, and some conventions that'll help you grow your team, grow your code base without um, as much pain. And this uh, this little features link is worth checking out if you're just trying to get an understanding of what is sales, why is it worth checking out. This is just a uh, random capture of a sales app. Um, this What you're looking at here is a script, but very similar to the code for a uh, action, which is how you handle a handle a request to the server, and very similar to the code for a helper, which is a exactly what it sounds like reusable bit of code. Um, won't get too much in the details here, other than to point out that uh, you get validation for free, you get uh, async functions, you get await usage, um, and you really get the the better part of the last yes. 11 or 12 years of uh, of learning and making mistakes um, and using this thing in production. So this is what's on the homepage right now for sales. Um, some of these folks are like, for example, Verizon. I don't know if they're still using it in Verizon stores um, like they were before, but some of this stuff is a range of 2013 to 2020 projects. Um, and it's companies that are huge and companies that are super small. Um, you can see we actually had talks from some of these folks uh, at SalesConf in the past. So uh, we had a engineering manager from Amazon, I think, last year, who gave a great talk about um, just 
how she kind of approaches her career and, and then how they're using sales. Um, and anyways, I'll let you check out all the old sales conf talks from 2021 and 2022, which get into this in a lot more detail. So sales at scale. We're going to cover some starting assumptions, some kind of ground rules about that will govern the rest of this talk um, so that we're all going into this together with the same idea. Because scale is something that's a little bit overloaded, and it can mean a lot of different things. Then we'll just talk briefly about, hey, is this advice any good? I'm just this random guy on the internet uh, telling you these things. Why should you listen to me? Um, and then we'll go over kind of what we'll cover, which is a series of six different topics about scaling. It's important to you that your app works. You want users to have a good time. You want to produce value. You want to focus on things that matter. Um, you dislike waste. You want to iterate and to move quickly. And whether you currently only have like five requests per minute or you have the legendary C10K where you have 10,000 requests concurrently every minute or so, you realize you're going to want to grow traffic more, um, or at the very least, it might happen on its own. You plan to add features and to make changes to your app in the future. You know there's going to be other things that get added. You know that there's going to be mistakes you made in your product design. You expect to continue growing the size of your development team over time. So you you plan to have a... You know, maybe if it's just you right now, maybe you're going to hire one other person. Maybe it's a co-founder. Maybe it's you and 10 engineers right now, and it's going to be 40 next year. Um, or it's you and 200 engineers in the department, um, and you're going to be 500 next year. Either way, um, every time you add more engineers, you add more people, and you add a network of connections um, that need to be optimized for. Um, and actually, Ankit uh, from Postman, and I think it was his 21, 2021 talk at SalesConf, he talks about uh, kind of how the APIs work between parts of an organization as you grow. And uh, I'll defer to him on that because Postman has grown to, I think, close to a thousand uh, people at this point. And so he's seen kind of how that, how engineering can change um, in a way that I just haven't seen firsthand yet myself. So recommend his talk for a look at that. So now we're getting into the, uh, all those are pretty easy assumptions, right? I mean, I think pretty much everyone is going to agree with these. Now we're getting to a little bit more of a tenuous set of assumptions. So stay with me and uh, hopefully we'll, hopefully we can proceed together with these assumptions. So you define acceptable performance as fast enough for my user's needs. You are practical. You think that building something that your users want is more important than winning a pissing contest about uh, who has the fastest tool um, or who can handle the most requests per second. You know the dangers of premature optimization. Um, you know how it can lead to complexity risk that'll bog down your ability to make future changes. You understand that it can cut out people that are great talent that maybe don't have the experience to use the technology and work with the decision framework that was chosen in order to kind of reach that higher level of optimization that may or may not have been necessary. Um, and most importantly, you are willing to be unpopular. You wanna learn what is true and not listen to the most confident voice in the room, even when it's the voice in your head and you're brave, and you are occasionally right. Okay, so assuming we're good on all those, is this advice any good? So I, I did a, when I was looking at older sales comp videos from previous years, I stumbled across this video that um, someone had made about how to interview um, as a sales.js developer, which I thought was, was pretty interesting. So I did not prepare anything like that, but I did find this resume gist that I made in like 2019 when I needed some cash pretty bad. Um, and this kind of says, this is the whole like obligatory slide um, about my believability in this area. So 
you can kind of look at what's going on with the sales framework. Um, a lot of folks have used that. The uh, but you know you're taking some advice from from this guy. So just to understand who I am, um, I've seen a lot of apps. I will uh, you know this is recorded, so feel free to to read the fine print here. Um, this has an example of some of the the brands that have used sales, some of the brands that I've worked with myself, and some of the things that I've done um, involving sales and Node.js. Um, I'm definitely not the best performance engineer in the world or the most experienced performance engineer in the world. Um, I think the reason why you you might want to consider what I have to say is that I've seen a lot of sales apps um, and I've dealt with a lot of optimization and scaling and whether that's people or process or request per minute, um, simultaneous requests hitting at the same time with like the thundering herd, like all of these things I'm saying were never me seeking these problems out. They were me clutching on for dear life as I was forced to solve these problems. Um, so please take everything I'm saying with that grain of salt. It is from coming from a practical perspective. Um, I have never once sought out this kind of a problem um, in terms of scale. It's always been a reaction um, and then a lesson learned that becomes proactive for the next time. All right, so enough about that. Oh yeah, so then, and the other thing kind of more recently, so I've recently scaled an employee to, a, or sorry, a company to um, an employee count in the in the 40s of, of team members. And uh, this is just a, a snapshot from Fleet's homepage, which is uh, the company where I am CEO today, which is open source device management and vulnerability management for laptops and servers, um, specifically focused on companies that have um, a thousand or more laptops today, although plenty of folks use Fleet, especially Fleet Free. And then we also have some customers um, that are uh, that are smaller as well. Um, and there's a way to kind of self-service, get yourself a license. It's an open core business. So growing that company has exposed me to a lot of team scale. Um, and when it comes to the engineering side, I've while I'm not the CTO of that company, thankfully, uh, Zach Wasserman is. Um, I've been close enough to it that I've had a chance to see how that looks, see how the product organization starts to scale um, and how kind of like product design and engineering fit together um, in the concept of, of a, um, a tool, a uh, framework to use to build your technology. Other things just to, I guess, contextualize what I'm telling to you. So I've been, Again, pull holding on for dear life uh, since 2012. And again, I'll let you read these kinds of things yourself if you like, but most recently, uh, several publicly traded companies um, have helped them with their sales apps um, or built sales apps for them with, with the team. Um, we've supported a few publicly traded companies, um, actually worked on a happy app at Walmart Labs. Um, which was cool. Uh, and that had a extremely high amount of scale. If you can kind of imagine what it's like to process um, payments at the little self checkouts with your phone. A um, bunch of Y Combinator startups have used sales and continue to. Um, there's been a, a few things to point out that we've really learned a lot from was when we launched Treeline, which is it, that was the Y Combinator company that, uh, that, Scott Gress and Earl Nathan and Rachel Shaw and Cody Stoltman and I built in 2015. And uh, that had a really successful launch on TechCrunch and on Hacker News, totally took us down. I was on a plane when it happened. Um, that was a huge learning experience that I will save mostly for the, for the chat and AMA we're gonna do um, live. Similar kind of a learning experience was from SHIP. So um, you may have, if you've ever searched SalesJS performance before, you've probably seen this old article from Kevin Burke at SHIP called Don't Use Sales or Waterline. Um, that thing had great SEO. And we, uh, so we've, we've answered a lot of questions about it in the sales community. Um, you may have even answered it yourself before. And the, uh, the points brought up in that article were really helpful to the company. We learned a lot from that, improved it. Um, and again, we can talk more about that in AMA. Uh, yeah, I'll let you read the rest. 
And also, yeah, uh, I guess on a bigger level, don't take my word for it. There are some other talks. Actually, I think this is, both of these are from last year. They kind of tie into the topics from today. So Solving Imaginary Scaling Issues by Michelle Riva and Real Life Unit Testing with Sales by Gustavo Garcia. Um, the latter fits more into like the scaling the team side of this problem. And the, the former um, addresses the uh, concurrency and traffic side. And I'll point out two more. So Postman uh, Ankit here gave a talk in 2021. I think already kind of alluded to it before. Um, he talks about going from zero to 15 million users, or not quite zero, because there was a previous version, um, on sales. Um, talks about the story, getting up to 700 million requests sent every month, um, and three and a half million monthly active users. Um, they're the highest rated developer tool on Stackshare. Um, and on G2, they're the highest rated in API management. Uh, startup valuations are all over the map this year, but uh, last I checked, they were a billion dollar company as well. Um, they're the number one utility tool in the world, number one API infrastructure company, number 20 fastest growing SaaS company in the world, um, and built on sales. Ezra sold his company to Stripe. Um, and he said, this was a kind of a, a cool quote from his talk, which we'll come back to this in a bit. But our public API code base, which is based on the sales framework, has been running in production since January 2016. And we went from one engineer, that's Ezra right there, to over 24 engineers. And now we serve 23 million requests daily. So what we'll cover in sales at scale? We'll cover one, what is scale? Two, what does it mean to be scalable by default? And is that even true? Three, how do we measure scalability? Four, what's it actually like to scale a app, a team, um, and a sales app in particular? Then five, scaling the sales framework. So what's it like to take your literal code you wrote in your sales app and the framework that's sitting underneath it and to scale both of those. Um, you know, what does sales the framework look like as you scale? What does user land look like and how is help sales helping or, or hurting you um, in there as you scale? And then also like how, uh, how do your integrations in your code scale? So your conversation with the database, your conversation with other third-party uh, APIs like Stripe um, or maybe a child process that you spin up. And then last is prioritizing scale. So trying to understand when does this stuff matter and why? So what is scale? So there's probably more than these, right? That we could that we could throw in this uh, throw in this bucket because scale is a pretty broad word. But the way I'm defining it here for, for our purposes today is it's a journey in four dimensions. Latency, which means like, hey, I send a request or I submit a form or whatever, and I see a loading spinner and it ticks and ticks. And then maybe like 200 milliseconds later, I get a response. And you can call different aspects of that latency. You can take apart that request timeline and kind of slice it up and say like, well, from the perspective of this piece of code, there was this much latency. But when I say the word latency here, what I really mean is just the whole time from the perspective of the API user, when I send that, you know, Ajax request or whatever, I uh, I see the spinner, I get the response. That's what I mean by latency. And that is just about one experience, right? One person or one integration that's trying to talk to your API or use your product. Um, what is their experience like? How fast or slow is it? That word latency is deliberate because another word you'll hear for this is performance, but that word performance is also really overloaded as well. So I'm just gonna kind of like throw that one out. If you hear me say that word, I probably actually mean latency. Latency can also be affected by concurrency, which is the true scalability. So if you say the word scalability to someone, depending on the context, it's a good chance they're gonna think of concurrency. And I'm using, again, another word that could be overloaded. I use the word concurrency here to refer to 
you know, instead of just that one conversation between an API user and the API provider, like your sales app and your front end code, for example, or like a mobile app. Now we're talking about 10,000 of those happening at the same time. And like, what, what is, what happens, right? What does that cause? What does that do to your response times, your latency? What does that do to uh, your server staying online? Does it crash? And then the third dimension here is stability. So this is probably one of the more, well, it's definitely the most underrated aspect of scale. It's mostly what people spend time fixing and um, fiddling with as they grow. Um, we'll talk a lot more about that one. Maintainability is not so much this, not so much the scaling of your app, but the scaling of the people that work with your app and the scaling of the contributor experience as those people contribute code and ideas um, to the to the product you're building. So just to point out about stability in particular, if you look at this quote from Ezra, you can see the order that he listed these things in, right? He's like, we've been running in production since January 2016. That was number one. We've gone from one engineer, that's me, to over 24 engineers. That was number two. And then number three is now we serve 23 million requests daily. So if we were going to break this down, this first thing, right? Let's see if I can annotate. Oh, yeah. This first thing, that is stability. What that means is that this server, this load balancer and servers and all the little pieces inside, they've all been successfully there, running. We haven't changed. We haven't like given up on this framework. We haven't given up or rewritten this code base. Um, we haven't had so many bugs that we just had to like throw in the towel, right? Like the server hasn't crashed so many times that we just kind of like gave up. That's the most important thing. Next is we've gone from one engineer, that's me, to over 24 engineers. And that's maintainability, right? So a combination of the way that Ezra structured those teams, the way that he trained those engineers, um, the way that he trained the managers to train the engineers, um, the way that all the supporting roles in other departments kind of helped out with the support quality or design or um, product. Whether that's the actual features of the sales framework um, the, itself, which Ezra is actually very, uh, he does an amazing job in five minutes in this video laying out exactly why they picked sales and how that went for them. So there's a link right here. I would recommend checking that out if you haven't seen that before. He'll do a much better job explaining it and his voice is very pleasant to listen to. Um, so that's maintainability, all those things. And then last but not least, except for his latency, we'll come back to that. Now we serve 23 million requests daily. So that's what I'm referring to as concurrency. So, you know, regardless of the period here, whether that's daily or in a certain minute or an hour or whatever, a second, um, that's about talking about the volume of traffic coming to, in this case, Paystack or now Stripe. And latency is nowhere to be found. But the funny thing is that if you talk to engineers about this and a lot, a lot of companies and really just kind of the broader culture out there, the kind of performance that I'm calling latency is often the very first thing you hear about. Um, and it can become almost a maniacal focus because it's kind of cool, right? Like it's cool to make something that's like so fast. It's super clear. You don't have to take a step back and be like, oh man, what did we do? What did we design here? Like how did we, these all these files we created, what were we thinking, right? Those kind of questions are... Uh, are not on your mind when you're when you're optimizing a piece of code. Um, and I've done it before myself. Uh, I've also gone overboard on it before myself. Um, I've employed people who have gone overboard on it. Um, I've employed people who've employed people who've gone overboard on it. Um, and sometimes it's worth it. Like sometimes, Sometimes latency is actually a thing you want to optimize for. And it could be not even in a uh, asynchronous bit of code. It could be in a bit of code that, uh, for example, there's a module called Parley, which is how if you ever, uh, if you've used Sales.js for a long time, you've seen .exec probably before. Um, 
if you haven't seen that before, that's great news because that means that you joined uh, this community after we had async await, which was probably really good for you. Um, so I'm really happy for you. So, um, but you can think about the same thing as as how the await works, right? Like if I do await user dot create in waterline, um, that's actually using this thing called Parley under the hood. And with Parley, because it's such a hot code path, because there's so many things that call await in your sales app, it made sense, I thought, to optimize for that. So let me just jump over really quick to Parley. We can take a quick look. And I think my talk 2021, we went into this in a little bit more depth about the history. So what I really, excuse me, what I really wanna show this time is just the kind of thing that this sort of benchmarking looks like. We're gonna come back to benchmarking in a second. And you can see it's pretty wildly different. Um, and there's some gotchas with benchmarks that again, we'll return to, but you can kind of see it's basically like run a function, whether that function involves hitting some API or in this case, just doing something uh, with the compute, right? Doing something with the CPU again and again, really quickly um, on the system. So in this case, this is testing how fast can we do an await, even though there's no internal uh, logic, basically. And you know, it feels good to get an extra 10 million operations per second, right? It feels good to get, you know, and you can see these different ones. This one with build and exec was 1.8 million off per second, got it up to three. It feels so good. But even as I was doing it, I didn't really know that it matters, right? It was a, it was a theory. At the end of the day, it became at least twice as fast. Uh, and I never spent the time or realistically money because this kind of load testing can consume some money. I never really did the time to see like, how does that, I never put in the time to see how does that affect a real production app that we have running? Um, and I don't really regret it. I think it was a good use of time considering just how hot the code path is here and how often um, this kind of thing is, is running inside of a sales app, even internally to sales. And yet, <laughs> I never really had the smoking gun evidence that it helped all that much, right? I know it's twice as fast in isolation, but I don't really know. Um, I don't really know how this performance optimization I made to a synchronous, you know, like a blocking thing um, that's a core part of the, the sales framework. I never really was able to see how does that play out because it's so app dependent and so use case dependent, right? So it's really not the right place to start. So where is the right place to start? All four of these things are important, but stability is the most important. And what stability means, we'll go into, we'll look at exactly what stability means in a second. But a lot of the things we hear people call scaling problems, or you might've read is a scaling problem in an article. Usually those things are actually stability problems or their maintainability problems. But more often than not, their stability problems. Beyond stability, focusing on contributor experience, meaning like, what is it like to use the framework? And then even at a higher level, what's it like to build on your app? What does your data model look like? What did you, what kind of models did you create? Um, how did you structure your actions and your helpers? You know, do you have 2000 helpers or did you manage to kind of like constantly redesign, refactor, and cut back that uh, that experience of actually using the reusable code in your app. And a lot of times you don't have time for that kind of thing, right? You'll be busy, you'll be shipping features. Um, but all of that actually can impact stability because the more you rush, the more sort of hard to tell what's going on for a new person that joined your team, the more likely it is that someone's going to introduce errors. Um, and we'll see a lot of examples of those in a bit, but I do want to pull this screenshot up. So this is a sales hook. It's not very pretty um, what it does, but it is, I'd say, pretty thorough. And it covers some ways that, that your sales app can break. So you can see here, deliberately crash the sales process by throwing an uncaught exception. Uh, I think this is not listed here, but another another way to do the same thing is an uncaught promise rejection. 
Um, in the past, when before async await, this was one of the most common problems with not just sales apps, but every every node app. Um, and it was very hard to do that right. So if I do, I look at the parley readme, and I would encourage you if you've never checked this thing out to uh, to have a look. It's it's still where I point people who are trying to understand the difference between callbacks and async await. So I'll just kind of flash it on the screen for you. Um, it's got some examples of how to do error negotiation with with async versus synchronous code. You know, using it callbacks versus await. It shows you how to do recursion with callbacks versus await. It shows you how to do for loops with recursion versus await. Or sorry, for loops with await versus um, callbacks. Uh, even if statements with callbacks versus await. Everything was so much harder with callbacks. And thankfully, this problem is mostly solved these days, um, as long as you are very, very consistent about using await. Oops. Yeah, let's go, let's look at one more thing in sales of dev. Something that you can absolutely still see happen in sales apps today is if you manage to not respond. Now this actions too made this better too, because um, in the past you had to literally code up like a res.send or a res.json or et cetera. Um, in order to send the response, otherwise it would just hang forever, right? Like you would see the loading spinner forever. Um, which was, wait, I say forever, two minutes by default in Node, which is, that's like a Node level thing that you can configure. But that too, luckily, has been mostly fixed. It's definitely possible to have something that never responds. But because of the way that Actions 2 work, whoops. Because of the way these work, um, and you can see this is a script, but it works exactly the same way here. We'll jump into a, uh, and here's the app that, I'm, that we're looking at, by the way. This is a, um, a vulnerability dashboard for, we're looking at your CVEs, uh, your um, common vulnerability exposures for your laptops or your servers, um, kind of seeing what, uh, what devices are affected or what server, cloud servers are affected. Um, and being able to kind of filter. It's pretty basic little sales app. It actually talks to the fleet API um, and, and does some like basic graphing um, and stuff like that. But the reason I have this pulled up um, is because it actually was a, an app recently where a lot of quote unquote scaling needed to happen. And that scaling was around data. Um, so again, we'll return to that in a bit. But just that's why we're looking at this. So here's an example of an action. You can see it's got inputs, which are the parameters, which are automatically validated, which means that this is a string. You know this is never going to be null. You know that if it was not specified, it's going to be undefined specifically. Um, and if it's required, then you know it will always be a string every time. And actually, we just found a bug because that should be required, right? Sure enough. So let's do, we'll do a little pull request and suggest a fix to Eric. Cool. So anyways, that'll say required. And this is in somewhat unusual one because actually doing a download of a file, but even then, like, you know, in the past I would have done like res.pipe in an express app for this. Um, the beauty of Actions 2 is it basically wraps you in shrink wrap, not literal NPM shrink wrap, but it, it wraps you in sort of a protective casing where it's, it's really hard to like forget to respond. All right, enough of that. I said I was gonna make this short. As far as sales like dev, we'll just run through them so you can see what the rest are. The other things that, that I would call a stability problem um, are, well, there's, there's all kinds of bugs, right, that can occur. And bugs can stack, which is really, can be really bad uh, because then it's hard to fix the, the bug you just covered up with another um, quick fix, right? So uh, 
I'll, but I'll kind of put aside the whole like bugs where we don't understand the root cause problem. Cause that, that's just like a, that's a problem in every language, every framework, um, specifically in a node app. And this is true for other frameworks too, but specifically the things that, that you may run into are the situation where you deliberately lock up the server process by overwhelming its CPU. So basically doing a while true. And by the way, the reason these are links, if you install this hook in your sales app, you can actually simulate each one of these, these situations for yourself. And you can experience like, what is that like? What does the error message look like when this happens? This will effectively crash the process, but it will hang and prevent any requests from getting handled while this is in this state. Um, this is a bug, right? This is an accidental infinite loop. Another similar thing is uh, overflowing the call stack by simulating, or well, in this case, we would simulate it, but in, it would normally be an accident, uh, a runaway recursive function. So really the same kind of thing as the one above. It's just that for the recursive function, you get a slightly different error message. Um, and it's helpful to kind of see that. So I'd recommend giving that a try. I will, uh, I will let you try that for yourself. It is sales hook dev just for the sake of time. Um, another one that you, that you may see is overflowing the processes available memory. So if you run out of RAM and this, this can happen with memory leaks. Um, if you, if you manage to get a memory leak into your code, I would say it's pretty rare as long as you're following the conventions of the sales framework. Um, in fact, I would say it's impossible if you're following the conventions of the sales framework. Um, but that's a way that your server can, that your process can crash. And then the rest of this is actually just specifically for testing and simulating memory leaks to kind of show the difference between, hey, memory that's just in use versus memory that can't be reclaimed when the garbage collector runs. Um, and this is kind of part of the same thing. So. You can ignore that for now. Again, those should not really be an issue for you as, as long as you're uh, using the conventions of the sales framework. All right. So, so, that's, so that's what is scale, right? So what is scalable by default? What's the design ambition behind um, how the sales framework works? In all four of these dimensions, whether we're talking about latency, whether we're talking about concurrency, um, if we're talking about maintainability, if we're talking about stability, the usability of your um, world that you've created for your dev team, right? Including yourself, um, especially yourself. That all impacts all four of those dimensions. Um, if you if you don't if you have a confusing or hard to ramp up on code base, um, or you have varying conventions, or you have like bad code comments that don't make sense, bad error messages, it it hurts your team's ability to onboard and and maintain the product. It hurts your ability to have a stable product for your users. So you're getting a lot more like 500 errors. Hopefully, you're actually looking at every single one. Um, individually, not just on a graph, right? Um, we'll talk about that more in a bit. It is making it so that when you do have a scaling issue, it's harder to, uh, like a concurrency issue with, with a lot of traffic and you're not, your app isn't, um, is slowing down as a result uh, or, or is leading, is crashing on people. It becomes a lot harder to tell what's going on, right? And then as far as latency is kind of the same thing. Like if, if, if something starts to slow down, a specific route starts to slow down, um, the, the worse the usability is inside your code base um, and kind of in the way that you collaborate in your organization, the harder it is to figure it out and get to the bottom of it. And the more likely it is that you're going to kind of just like slap a coat of paint on it. And the first time it sort of seems like it's fixed, you just kind of move on. So what is it when we talk about like this usability, what do we mean? So there's there's the developer experience, right? And that I would actually break that down into two pieces. There's like the user land developer experience, meaning you writing Node.js code in your sales app. Like you're writing actions, you're writing helpers, you're writing scripts, you're writing routes and policies. And then there's the API user experience. So this is maybe a front end developer or a mobile developer or a, uh, I always get confused whether there's downstream or upstream, but someone who calls your API from some code, right? Um, 
their their experience matters too. Like the better your error messages are from your API, um, the easier it is to tell like how your API is documented. Um, all of that impacts their success. And if they don't have those, if they don't have, uh, if it's not easy and clear, they're more likely to create a situation that can actually cause more scaling issues. So for example, the harder it is for a front-end developer to understand the API that you're providing with, with your sales app, um, the more likely it is that they're going to end up calling the same endpoint more than once, more, more than they need to, or uh, doing the thing we talked about before about slapping a cone of pain on, you know, they don't really know how the API is supposed to work anyways, because the documentation is not clear. The code is hard to trace, even if it's JavaScript, you know, if you have like a thousand files or you have a bunch of functions just kind of like on a, in a single file and you don't have a lot of structure, it's pretty discouraging for someone that, that had, didn't write that code to come in and, and mess with it, right? Um, so you can actually cause scalability issues just by having a bad API usage experience. A um, couple other ones to point out that aren't always immediately obvious is like operator experience. So especially when you get to a bigger org, it's often not the same person that deploys the app initially and kind of like maintains and responds to, um, you know, priority one, middle of the night issues. It's often like a separate person. Maybe they're on a, a dedicated DevOps team or a site reliability engineer, or it could just be, it could be you or your team, right? Um, the actual developer. And then kind of connected to that, I'm not sure it should really be nested, but the inheritee experience. So the person who takes over from you, and this is kind of true for the operator experience too. You know, they take over the config that you've set up. They take over the deployment model that you've put out there, um, the database you've chosen. All of that can dramatically impact uh, the success, right, of your, of your app. So um, if you walk out the door tomorrow and you leave your app in the hands of someone else, like, what's going to happen? The design ambition behind sales is to have all of that be solved by default. And we'll go over some of the ways that the framework does that for us uh, in a bit. So another topic um, that's pretty, you know, pretty important here is like, how do we, how do we actually tell whether we've made it any better? You know, I mentioned with Parley, you saw all those metrics and those, the benchmarking we did. And and uh, you just heard me say I don't know if it actually if it actually uh, I know it helped, but I don't know how much it helped, and it's hard for me to tie it to a real like business value, right? Like I, it's hard for me to map these numbers to like whose user experience, what human had a better time as a result of these improvements. I think a lot of people had a slightly better time, but was it the most important thing for me to be working on? I don't know, probably not. And it was motivated by scaling issues we were having with, with TreeLine. Um, but there was also like deeper root causes there with um, was kind of like having layered on code and some of the problems that I'm talking about here. Um, and when we went and started kind of rebuilding that code, one of the things that, that we wanted to emphasize is, okay, let's make sure that the hottest code paths in sales are going to be fast enough. But that was kind of backwards, right? Because what we should have done is we should have started from, in this case, the outside in and said, okay, like specifically, where's my problem? Like, I'm not just going to say, I'm going to allocate a week to work on performance, right? There's some key problem that's making me want to do this. Um, so that's actually kind of the answer to when benchmarking is useful is it is a tactic you can use to get to the bottom or the root cause or to improve some performance or scale related business problem you have, but it's never an end in and of itself. Um, or it can be, but once it becomes an end in and of itself, it's very seductive and very fun. Um, and you feel very proud for having done it. Um, and it gets back to the pissing contest we were talking about before a little bit. So what does a benchmark actually tell you? Well, in the case of the example we just looked at, it's telling you how many operations per second it was able to run. Like how many times was it able to call a particular function again and again 
uh, or like somewhat in parallel as much as anything can be in parallel with the event loop. Um, and at least in at least in this case, it's it doesn't really tell you a whole lot about scale um, in terms of concurrency. At least not with an async function, right? Like you can you can uh, for Parley for the await functionality in the sales framework. Yeah, something blocking and synchronous. You can really you can optimize that for sure. Oops. Um, but when it comes to and you can actually see this here, so you can see everything's kind of getting better. Like here, we looked at the two first ones. Let's look at number three. So we went from about four million ops per second. Um, well, we only got slightly better there. So like the just build with nine custom methods, we we gained a little bit. That's probably like statistically insignificant. Uh, and then the next one here, we went from 1.2 up to 1.8 million ops per second. So that's okay. That's pretty good. Um, but like, what does what does any of that actually? What does that mean? You know, here we've sped up some synchronous code. But look at uh, look at this. So this is. Now uh, here we go. Find okay. So find an exec. So you can see this is a way different number, right? Instead of a million ops per second, this is like 34. Um, and so we're looking at the faster one in, from July of that year. We go back to January, we look at find. We can see it was 33.69 ops per second. And then this other version of it was 33.93, very slightly faster, right? So if I look at those two things here, let's see, we're looking at 33.6, 33.9. It's actually slower. Wait, no, it's not. Okay, it's it's pretty close. It is slightly faster, but we're talking about one more operation per second, right? Um, that means like you could have one more query run, and it's kind of like, was this worth it? <laughs> I don't know, right? It's it's hard to tell. Uh, it's hard to tell. Like, okay, sure, we only did thirty four ops per second with this the way this benchmark is set up. So how can we really like, you know, normally we're relying on millions and millions of these things. So we can kind of test the scalability on a single process because we're really testing the CPU when we do this stuff. And we're testing like the memory usage landscape of this, of this functionality. But here, I mean, yeah, like maybe, maybe that's why this is slightly faster. You know, it's, it's so close. I'm not even convinced that, it, that it's statistically relevant. Right. Uh, so so the kind of so if we look at if we look at that specifically with async await and with with more like an asynchronous thing that we want to um, benchmark, that's where you get into the realm of of load testing, because what you're actually trying to do is say like okay so on a server, I want to hit it with a bunch of requests and I want to know that like does my app my sales app on that server, um, does it respond well like how does it React. I really want to know like an end-to-end -end simulation of what's actually going to happen so that I can get to the root of the business problem. And that's kind of the, the hardest thing about this whole uh, problem is that you don't really always know what the business problem exactly is. Like you don't know exactly what endpoint people are having problems with, right? The way it feels as a user is just like, I don't know, it hung forever. Um, and especially when timing issues and spinners start happening, um, maybe the front end code doesn't actually handle all the loading states, right? Like a really important thing to do in any app is to go and take a look at the, uh, the throttling option, right? And when I load this page, it doesn't load like terribly, terribly fast. It used to be way slower, I promise you. This is one of the things that we, uh, actually Eric mostly optimized, um, I think we got a response in, let's see. You can look at this timing thing. Y'all are probably like, oh man, this is really slow, but I'm gonna keep poking around until I find it. Somewhere in here, you can see the actual response time. And it's like kind of like crazy late. I think it's almost 6 a.m. right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop right there. Uh, hopefully you guys will believe me that it's possible to check the response time. 
but the thing that you just saw used to take i think 45 seconds to, to load um because this is pulling a bunch of data from different models it's not even like a scale issue from traffic it's not a real concurrency issue it's really it's a stability issue because of the kind of queries it's running and the kind of data munging it's doing um at runtime so there's different ways to solve that problem we won't get into that right now whether it's caching or um just uh just changing the way that you kind of munge the data together um or even uh, in certain situations even using native queries although um I tend to try to avoid that for as long as i can the experience of this loading and being slow regardless of whether we actually have a problem it's something that you can test for right um so a really a, the first thing i always try to to help people that are new to, to quality or qa understand is that this is like much in the same way that if like hey if there's a form field try overflowing it try leaving it empty try pasting the entire moby dick novel into that form field right um in the same way here, like try loading the page on slow 3G and see whether it's clear what the heck's going on, right? Like try changing the filters on slow 3G. Does it properly prevent you from um, from creating weird unknown situations and timing issues? But you can see this is like not a great experience. We could use a little bit of a better loading spinner, but it's okay, right? Um, and you can see here we are, we're simulating through slow 3G. Let's see what happens when I click this. So, okay, loading state, not great, but it's kind of doing that interstitial thing like on Apple, it's fine. And okay, okay, now here comes the loading state and then there comes the data. So, you know, if you hadn't tested everything that thoroughly, what does that mean? Well, when you start, uh, experiencing problems, whether you don't even know whether it's a latency problem or a scale uh, problem or a concurrency problem, you will find not only is it hard for your users to report what's going on because maybe there's no loading spinner, maybe things aren't getting disabled, and they just keep clicking. You know, you're crawling through your logs, you're trying to puzzle out what happens. Um, it can be pretty hard to tell what's going on. And in some ways, it's kind of too late. Like you really are trying to reproduce it yourself. So I see load testing as a way to add a layer of protection for yourself. Um, you probably don't want to do this every time you merge a pull request, right? It's quite expensive to do meaningful load testing, especially when you have an app with like really high scale. Fleet has some customers with 300,000 or more um, servers and laptops that all phone home very frequently um, to a single fleet instance. Um, there's free users that have 400,000 or more hosts that all phone home to a fleet in sense. Sometimes it's 10,000, sometimes it's 100, right? So you don't always see, you know, and when we dog food this ourselves, we don't see what it's like to have 100,000 hosts, right? All phoning home at the same time. So like at Fleet, the way we handled is we implemented a load testing process that runs every time we do a release. So every three weeks. And uh, that is... Uh, not perfect. It could be better. Like it, I, I can't say we've successfully caught it every time, but it was really a reaction to running into these kind of problems and saying like, okay, so how can we like be proactive about catching these things? Well, let's drop the like I think it's like literally thousands of dollars to go run like a load test that simulates a true customer environment. If at least thirty thousand, I think we do slightly more than that now, um, and we did way bigger sizes, uh, you know, a few times. And so you're really with load testing and there's, there's ways to get it cheaper. You can use spot instances. And I think there's uh, nowadays uh, actually faster ways than that. Um, I didn't actually build the load testing piece that we did at Fleet. And nothing about that needs to be tied to sales particularly, because what you really want to do is just simulate clients talking to your API. But you're really balancing costs and time investment and extra process and red tape with certainty that you're going to have a good experience for your users. Which brings us to YOLO, which is you only live once. Um, and that I think should be the default, right? Like uh, there's plenty of times where it's not appropriate, right? Like if you're launching to, let's say you have a, a large customer with a ton of data and you don't want to, um, yeah, it's not a good time. It's not a good time to YOLO. 
uh, that, right? You don't want to find out for the first time as you screw up someone else's uh, experience. But hopefully you've been testing this yourself. You've been dog fooding it. You've been kind of like growing and growing and growing the amount of uh, data and requests per second or requests per minute that you're trying. And like for most apps, that is totally fine. The difference is when you find that, hey, we have a lot of data um, or we have a lot of traffic. And that's where if you know you're going to make that commitment, if you're going to sign on a dotted line and make a promise and say, whether you sign or not, you're going to make a promise to someone and say, I will make sure that this handles the scale you need. Um, then you you do need load testing, right? Because how else can you reach that, that level of certainty? All right. So scaling, actually. So a look at the bottlenecks and what it's actually like to go through this process. So what happens when you launch a thing and it grows? So these are kind of the stages that you'll run into. Um, sometimes it's not going to be in this order exactly, but you can kind of think of it. Um, you can kind of think of it in this way. It begins with productionization, meaning like you're trying to actually go live, but you probably haven't yet. And you're doing deploys. Um, you are doing some internal testing. Hopefully, you're dog fooding the product. If, you, if it's something that you have a, um, when I say dog fooding, I mean like eating your own dog food um, from your dog food factory. So you're actually using your own product, um, ideally. And if not, you have some friendly testers, and you have uh, everybody on your team QAing, um, even the salespeople, even the marketing people. Everyone is using this app as often as possible at this phase. So then you manage to get it live and there's real people on there. And that's like, that's the launch. And there's always new things you learn during the launch. Then you realize you need to make changes, right? And so all of these things like database migrations start to come up. Then you start to actually get traffic. Like there are probably some apps out there that actually have D happen right after launch. But the reality is that most, most applications don't work that way. Most of the time, there's changes you have to make before people will actually start using your, um, your product. And then it becomes all about team, really. So the framework and the structure and the architecture of the way you're, um, and also just the, the focus and the discipline on continuing to refine like the abstractions you've created in your code, whether it's your data model, your helpers, and um, focusing on cutting features, right? As much as possible the whole time. Like that's kind of assumed here throughout. Um, and it's something you you really presumably already sort of addressed when you started pushing a lot of changes. There's another layer, which is as your team starts to really add engineers and you, you add engineering managers and you start to have an entire discipline of work focused on like shaping user stories and on prioritizing what to do next. Um, that really changes a lot, right? And even just having three developers all trying to edit the same file and like the increased merge conflicts and all of that stuff comes with its own problems. So we'll talk about these uh, each one by one and we'll go relatively quick here because uh, I think most of this is going to be pretty self-explanatory. The part that might be new to you is if you've never gone through these pieces before. So I'll just ask that if anybody has questions, like hit me up at the live chat AMA. Um, and I would love to go back through this and just share like real world stories. Um, but it'd be easier if you ask kind of what you're interested in. So productionization. So this is where reality sets in. Even early friendlies are starting to find bugs like you just wouldn't have expected. Um, hopefully you weren't just testing the happy path and you've been like real focused on fixing edge cases and like imagining ways to break it. Hopefully you've got a, a QA team that's like got a literal sledgehammer and is just trying to destroy the laptop as they're using your product. But not everyone does. Um, and even if you do, your users are going to find stuff you didn't expect. Um, this is why it's so important to launch quickly and then iterate with small frequent changes. Because the longer that you're in this productionization hell and pre-productionization hell, the worse off you are, right? Like there's going to be stuff that you're not expecting. There's going to be problems that you uh, can't see. And there's also going to be you trying to do a lot of things at once when you don't really know what the risk is. Um, I was working on a problem actually at Fleet this week where we were implementing some retries. And uh, 
I think we had three sessions on it and we, we finally came to the conclusion after talking to more people on the team, talking to the product manager, um, uh, working with design, it was like, you know what? We don't even need to do three tries right now to achieve some value here. And it's not exactly what we wanted to ship, but let's do that. Like, let's de-risk the thing we're trying to ship right now. It's valuable, get it live. And then let's go and let's add these retries um, later. And I won't get into what they're, it's something for, for uh, Mac OS configuration profiles, right? But it could be anything. Um, and that like kind of, that kind of, uh, emphasis on cutting off a small piece iterating as long as it's actually valuable to someone to a user um and just shipping that and getting it live it will force you to deal with the bugs right and it'll create a culture where you you deal with bugs and they don't get swept under the rug because they're actually affecting users doesn't mean you should try to ship bugs it's just acknowledging the fact that you will So the quicker you launch to real users, the easier this first time launch productionization process will be. The apps that struggle the most with this are the apps that work for six months without getting it into the hands of users or a year or more, right? The longer you go with code that's forked off from something that's in production, the, the riskier it gets. Launch quickly, minimize surprises. Okay, so launch. So real world product launch means literal people are using it. Um, maybe they're people that you sent there, right? But somebody is using it and they're expecting it to work. They're probably expecting it to work more than you might have, than you might have thought. And especially, um, you know, if this is your, well, if it's your first app, but even if it's your third or fourth app, right? Um, if you haven't been there for the whole journey of launch and planning the launch and being responsible for the decisions, it's really easy to sort of uh, not really come to terms with the expectations, so not really truly have achieved that empathy, which is why it's so important to actually use your own products um, because that will help a, a boatload. You're gonna be way better at QA. You're gonna, way, you're gonna be way better at anticipating what problems people are likely to run into. Um, and this one I will click. So this is where you get your first 500 errors start to come in. When I say come in, and I say that very, very deliberately because the default often is that 500s become a graph, right? But like what 500 means, right? Like if we were to Google, what is a 500 error or anything in the 500s? This is an unexpected condition. That means it's a bug. That means it's something that you did not expect to happen is happening and you have no idea what it is and any fix you would try to make for that or if you ignore it and you keep adding more features who knows what kind of weird shaky foundations you're building on top of right um let's think of think of an example well this is more of like a landmine but imagine uh, some code that looks like this I'm just going to put returns so you understand that's the end, right? So maybe like you don't ever hit this code path here uh, most of the time. You definitely didn't in your testing. And in this code path, maybe it's like, a, you know, like maybe we return like hello world here. But in here, we kind of like we throw. So, you know, there's some typos in there, but there's one typo that especially matters, which is this one, right? And what that's going to do in the old world before async await is that could literally crash your entire process and you could end up DDoSing your own app from that one tiny typo. Thankfully, with async await, it makes it so that Node behaves like everything else, right? So like just as if you were in Ruby or PHP or Python or Java or Golang or any whatever, right? Uh, C++, whatever. Um, the difference here is that now with async await, this will actually throw an error, but it's not going to throw this error, which would be helpful. It's going to throw a different error that's going to say that, I mean, let's, what's going to happen if I try that, right? So 
So if I do new error, I'm going to get that. I'm going to get uncaught reference error. Error is not defined. And unfortunately, like I needed to see this. And especially if I have a separate SRE team or a separate DevOps team or infrastructure team or support team even, they really needed to see this too in the loss. Because what they're going to get, you know, they'll get a stack trace, right? If I do a try and then I put this in a catch and then I sort of like console.log error.stack. Yeah, you know, like there it is. And I'm in the I'm in the redevelop print loop right now. So it doesn't really the stack isn't the most useful, but this would tell me like what file was this in, what line of code. Um, and that can work, but again, the norm is that a lot of support teams aren't trained to go in there and look at that line of code and see, oh, they're missing an R and error, right? So what that means is a bug issue gets created, which loads you up with more inventory of work to be done to where you're you're basically creating a situation where your team is like swimming upriver in the stream of bugs coming in. And meanwhile, new code is being added here or code is being copied and pasted. So like, it's like, oh, got to make some new routes. And you get the idea. And then before you know it, your app is riddled with these like bullet holes. When if we had just reacted quickly the first time we got the 500 error in, in the first place, it's like, yeah, it feels like, oh man, why do you got to be such a nag, right? Like, or why do we have to like drop what we're doing and work on this? But the reason is because the alternative is this, right? And this is one example that I could think of. Like I literally thought of this right now. I've seen so many of these occur in real life. It can happen on the front end. It can happen on the back end. It can happen in any framework. Um, thankfully, when it happens in sales apps now, it's not any worse than any other, in any other tool set. But it's a real problem and it's something that was not intuitive and took a long time to learn. And I found it's, you can face a lot of resistance in implementing that because it feels like extra work, right? Nobody really likes to take on extra work and they're not used to doing it. Which is why, you know, if we, we have a lot of these, these little sections that we link to in the handbook, because that way, when we bring on someone new to the team, it's like your onboarding points you to this, you read it. If we find that somebody needs some coaching or help with this, we can link them straight to this place in the handbook and and there you go so tldr we consider every 5x error 5xx error and also like response timeout um or an error scheduled job like a p1 priority one incident create an outage issue no matter the environment as soon as the issue is detected even before we understand we always determine impact quickly reach out to the affected users to acknowledge their problem and determine the root cause and that's the other part of it is this and this is more of like a bonus right but from a business perspective, what this lets you do, um, like I used to work at Starbucks and we would hand out these drink coupons when we'd have customers that had a bad experience. Like, I don't know, maybe I made the wrong drink twice for them, which happened regularly. I was terrible at the, at the bar. Like, and so I would, I would, or I put the wrong milk in there and they're like, oh, they wanted non-fat, no foam, right? Um, if things get heavy, like we could pull out one of these customer recovery certificates and just be like, here you go, free drink next time. Sorry about that. And I'll remake your drink now. And they'll be like, hey, it's, it's good. You already tried twice, right? So like, but you get that opportunity. And sometimes when you give people those coupons, they completely change and they actually become like super loyal and, and they become like your friend basically because they thought you were going to be a certain kind of way and you weren't, right? So just from a business perspective, it's really nice to be able to engage with these, these people, especially early on and say like, hey, you had an error on our website. We saw you. We understand that that was an unpleasant experience for you. And we'd like to give you a month for free, et cetera. Um, this is not a commitment that Fleet will always do that. Fleet has done things like that in the past. Um, at the very least, it can be nice to say, we're sorry about that. And we really appreciate you persisting, right? Anyways, just specifically as a developer, it helps us learn. You never know whether an error like this is a real issue until you take a close look. And just PS, it always is. If it's a 5XX, it's always a real issue. At the very least, the backend code needs to have some you know, error negotiation added to it, right? Um, the backend code needs to have something like Right. Uh, and, and, you know, let's, let's do it the right way. So like in a, in a sales app these days, you would probably write it like this. I mean, you could do status code, but that's going to use your custom response, right? 
so you, your interaction or whatever and so maybe then you're doing like because at that point, I don't need it to be a log, right? This is an expected error. This is a 4xx, not a 5xx error. That means this is expected to happen, right? And this is good for when you want to, someone's forbidden from accessing something, unauthorized, any of the 400 series status codes. Um, all right. And if you're wondering, like, how do I send data back through this exit? That's in the Actions 2 docs. Um, and I'm going to resist the urge to go on that tangent as much as I like talking about Actions 2. Uh, so we can stay on track with our timeline. Okay, so that's 5xx errors. There's actually more in this link. And uh, if this is something that uh, is interesting for you, I, I definitely recommend reading it. We've put a lot of work into that into that page. Um, bug reports are coming in. So you're scaling at launch and uh, you're not even really scaling yet. You're scaling past having zero users to like two or three. Um, you you find that there's bugs that you just didn't expect, right? Um, and they are now, you're starting to get weirder bugs than you were when it was just you, your team and the friendlies. You also are starting to realize you don't have the admin tools you need. You probably cut the scope. You're probably like, oh, we don't need to make it so that you can log in and see the orders that have come in, or we don't need to make it so you can log in and like generate a license key or something, right? We'll just... Well, yeah, we'll just hand, wave our hands at it and ignore it because <laughs> realistically, you're trying to get something live that people can use, right? Yourself included. So you end up doing a lot of changes that are kind of like new service area you add to the app. And those changes can often be uh, done a little quick and dirty, right? Because you're like, oh, it's an internal tool. It doesn't matter as much. And that can be fine. But it's again, it's taken up your time at this stage as you're, as you're scaling your products. You're also starting to see some of the most obvious product design flaws, right? Like now that you have real users in there, it's like you may have had false assumptions about what they were actually trying to do, or maybe what they said was different from what they really needed, right? Um, and those things are starting to become clear. And other times the customer won't even tell you or the user won't even tell you, and you're just realizing this from uh, now that you've talked to more customers, now that you're hearing more customers' feedback about the product, maybe you went into the product's um, and that additional context you're getting is helping you see the design flaws yourself. And ideally, you're someone who uses the product yourself anyways, because then all this stuff is way more intuitive for you. Early performance issues due to data volume or inefficient queries start to show up. So this is kind of what I was talking about before. If you have, uh, you know, 10,000 or hundreds of thousands of, of uh, records and like, let's say the vulnerabilities um, we were looking at a second ago. Uh, and these are vulnerabilities in like an app like Figma on someone's laptop or um, on something like OpenSSL on a server, right? Or even in a Chrome extension. There's a lot of vulnerabilities and there's a lot of connections to specific versions of software. And there's a lot of connections to specific hosts of which you might have hundreds of thousands. You don't necessarily need a lot of traffic to run into those problems. And this is about when you start to see them, right? Um, it, assuming you didn't do any kind of like load testing, um, which is not even really load here, it's more like data load. So I'm not even sure it's fair to call it load testing, but if you didn't do any kind of testing with large amounts of data, you might not have seen these things until real users got in there. The other thing is that the users start to show up when you least expect them. So you find out they're like, oh man, we have like a big APAC uh, user base. Um, now, thankfully the sales framework uh, it's really easy. Our website doesn't have a lot of interactivity, right? Like you can, you can sign up for flagship, you can do different things like that, but there's not a ton, um, there's not a ton of interactivity on the sales.js homepage. That said, you can see uh, in the analytics that like, especially like uh, as Africa in the last five years started to grow like crazy in terms of um, adoption of sales. And I think just Every uh, every kind of developer tech, which is like really cool to watch in the analytics graph, like you can see that stuff. And they're also coming in at different time zones, right? So Europe and Africa are coming. If you're in the U.S., they're going to come in in the morning. If you're in the U.S., APAC comes in in the you know 6 p.m. 7 p.m. time frame um, in, in the evening, and uh, which is which is the morning of the next day for them. Um, and that's a uh, it can be, it can mean you're getting a lot more surprise messages in the middle of the night. And it means that you're having, you may, maybe you have like a really good support team and you're like, we respond in 30 minutes or less every time, right? If someone has a problem. 
but you're probably not doing 24 seven support yet and you just launch, right? Um, so that can sometimes be a bit of a surprise. Then you start to make changes. So hopefully you've already been doing code reviews and you have somebody approving stuff. Um, it's probably like kind of peer reviews at this stage or it's like one person reviews the rest of the teams. I'd recommend the latter if you can, um, just cause it, you can have a great team where peer reviews are working. You can also end up on teams where peer reviews can be a problem. So if you're picking one, I would lean towards having a single DRI for the entire code base or a single directly responsible individual who approves uh, changes. You're also deploying these changes. So you, you, if you didn't have a process before to kind of like auto deploy from a pull request getting merged or, or something like it really could be whatever fits for the level of risk that you have for your product. Um, nonetheless, you have some kind of process that has to be followed, even if it's just a bunch of check boxes, right? On like an issue template. But hopefully there's some more automation than that. You also are dealing with database migrations. Um, you're dealing with API compatibility. Meaning like, you know, you uh, you may have people integrating with your API now, and so you don't want to break it without giving them um, at least notice, but hopefully you're doing some kind of semantic versioning. And if you're, if you're uh, deploying with the script that's included in sales apps, or if you're someone who's taken the Platzi course um, back in the day, uh, that script is, uh, is basically using the package JSON files, semantic versioning. Um, and the, the idea and the way that's supposed to work is that you then increment the major version when you make a breaking change to the API. So meaning you can't go back, um, or meaning you can't go forward rather, sorry. You mean you can't go forward. So if, if you remove a route, right, somebody who was on the old version uh, with their front end code is not gonna be able to, to do that anymore. I digress, uh, that's Simver. Deprecated or vulnerable dependency is also starting to be a thing. So maybe you have like a green keeper thing or you have like a just GitHub security thing or, or maybe you're using GitLab and there's like, I think there's a little bit more depth in the GitLab version, it's a little easier. Um, you, you start to notice all these vulnerable dependencies and 90% of them probably don't matter, but all too often you end up just kind of like, eh. Um, and not looking at them soon. So they start to build a backlog, right? Um, so you end up having to build a process where you're like triaging basically those vulnerabilities. And uh, that, that discipline is called AppSec or application security or sometimes product security, but I think usually application security. Changes start to become more intentional. Meanwhile, as you realize the endless work left to do, right? All the things that you're going to have to add, it all starts to feel a lot harder once you start to realize how much surface area there's gonna be to build what you need. Um, and also once you realize the things you don't know, um, you don't know the right way to build them to make users like it. And this link here, I won't go through it now, but just for, for folks looking at this um, deck, this is the way that we make changes at Fleet. And you'll see that this is pretty similar to other companies. Uh, it's not every company does it. Some are some are more just kind of wild west. Um, if you look at like GitLab, for example, they have a what they call a validation phase and then the implementation phase. This is super similar. This was not based on that. This was developed independently. Um, and uh, one of one of several times I found this same process implemented different ways um, at different companies. But basically, design it first. Make sure it has a business case. Make sure it goes to, we'll talk about product groups in a second. And these are all sort of like team scaling issues, right? If we go back to the four dimensions of, uh, of scaling, we're really talking about maintainability and stability above everything else right now. And then at a certain point, you actually start to have significant traffic. Um, I'm thinking of a, a real estate app I once worked on where it started to get to like 100,000 in revenue per month. And it wasn't that much traffic traffic. Um, it wasn't like C10K. It wasn't 10,000 requests per minute. Like apps like that are actually... Um, may or may not be, uh, may or may not have the same scaling profile, right? Like if you have a really, really hot uh, hot route that's getting hit by a lot of requests at the same time, it may be very simple and it could be that it just doesn't, it, uh, it's not that risky, right? It's not gonna, maybe you're not gonna have very many problems at all. 
but there's a lot of things that can start to happen as you have more traffic and just depending on the the kind of the character of your app um it can actually be the routes you least expect that'll cause you problems right um it could be you have a good product it could be that you've gotten lucky we're giving away free boxes of wheat thins, which is a literal sales JS app uh, thing that happened once when I think in that case, there was a auto migration incident that wiped 70,000 users who had signed up or something like that. A um, lot of ways you can have traffic and that we learned from that, you know, and when I heard that feedback, uh, I think that was when it was mostly just me. It was like uh, 2012 or 2013. No, it was, I think we had like two or three people working on the project. Um, and story asking about that in the AMA, but it's not just traffic. It's also the time and it's the varied usage. So the examples I'm thinking of, like once we had that, like once we hit that hundred thousand revenue mark per month, it was like, um, you had people actually really paying and using the product and the stuff they would run into is it was more like uh things that they try to do that you just had never anticipated testing right um unusual errors are triggering never before run code paths and they're tripping on typos that somehow escaped the linter so we just the thing i just showed in the code editor um that error without the extra r that should have been caught by um you know our npm run lint script that's bundled in every sales app by default like running that would have caught that um but if that's not hooked up to your CI CD or your team is not trained to have that hooked up in their text editor, uh, totally could happen, right? You can absolutely have, you could have hundreds of those checked into your app. Um, I did a code review recently where I found several, um, and it's just sort of inevitable if you don't have the linting hooked up. And I really ideally in both places, the editor and in the CI CD. Super avoidable problem. Um, Third party APIs can go down. So you start to notice when Stripe goes down for 19 minutes. Um, I was actually giving a talk at Postman's conference once in San Francisco. And uh, about 20 minutes before I was supposed to go on a panel, I looked at my phone and I saw you know, every 500, right? So if Stripe is down and you, let's say you have a business built pretty heavily on Stripe where people pay with a credit card, you didn't really plan for that, you know? <laughs> you might've, but you would have had to build that kind of app before. Um, won't get into this here, but that's where stuff like dot retry and dot timeout came into the sales framework. Um, every helper supports those by default. Every helper supports intercept and tolerate by default. Uh, a bug corrupts database records and now you need a script to fix it. So that's another thing that can happen is that one, uh, you know, Stripe went down for 19 minutes. You had 20 people trying to pay money with a credit card. It failed. You know, now it kind of goes all the way back to where you're we at before. Like you realize you don't have the admin tools you need because you probably don't have a way to get people actually resolving the problem. But hopefully at this point, you've gotten some way of being able to look up users. And so people are starting to starting to do that. So assuming, you know, assuming you build that kind of like infrastructure, there's some kind of like order dashboard, they can go and like look and they can reach out to the user and they can say, hey, I'm so sorry that happened. Or, you know, our payment provider ran into an issue and but it's totally our fault for not having a, a backup or whatever, you know, but taking responsibility. Um, meanwhile, though, all of those things might have failed. Uh, you know, you might have written the code in such a way where if that that specific spot in the code, if Stripe fails, maybe something got messed up in the database and like their account could be unusable, right? Or their data could be screwed up. They could end up with weird like activity feed items, this sort of thing. And so now you need to go run a script to fix it, which means you need to write a script to fix it. Um, and you're trying to give your talk at the Postman conference, right? Because you didn't necessarily plan ahead for this kind of stuff. Uh, seldom used features, edge cases, and rare combos of all of these situations we talked about can also sort of like combine to cause problems, like sort of like what we just described. Uh, I also can share more stories about that at the, uh, at the AMA. Let's go back. Okay, so the other thing that starts to happen. Is that you you really start to see things that actually get driven by the traffic. So maybe you realize that like, you know what, like people trying to generate those PDFs at the same time 
um, or specific actions they're taking one after another are causing load issues you just you didn't expect, right? Um, maybe there's certain routes that are just especially intensive um, or more, more likely than not doing a bunch of queries or doing a bunch of async calls. Or let's say, let's, you look at the code, there's a bunch of awaits in it, right? And the awaits might be inside of a loop or something. Um, that is that can also surprise you. And it's not necessarily just, whoa, lots of traffic, everything is slow. Because in that case, you just upgrade the size of your database usually um, if you're using a managed database. And you, you'll find that that gets you through probably the first, like, I don't know, 10 times that happens. Uh, infrastructure cost begins to matter at least a little bit. Because that's the other thing you're doing. Every time you bump up your database a size, which usually the database is where most of the cost is coming from if you're using a managed database, um, you're trying to pay a lot of money every month, right? Like, you know, I'm just thinking if you're on the cheapest Heroku thing, that's going to be your highest cost. You're going to quickly get to where you're spending like $500 a month on your database. Um, before you know it, especially if you're in kind of like a bare metal thing like AWS, you can end up spending $10,000 a month. You can end up spending, I just had a bill that was $80,000 from AWS. And then, you're, and then you start adding engineers. So the team grows, engineering managers get hired, process happens, agile or similar. So this is kind of just, I'll show you where it is. We won't read through it all right now, but just taking this back to the, the fleet handbook, there's some pretty good content here about um, Scrum that we use to train our team and about agile. Um, unplanned work starts to become an issue, meaning like firefighting or like surprises, basically. Um, you find you need to make work visible Unplanned work is actually just linking to the Phoenix project. So I'll, I'll let you guys check that out. It's a novel, easy read, skip the last third. Um, and then in terms of making work visible, like really you're, you're saying, hey, like I wanna see when stuff comes in so we can prioritize. And I also wanna see how much firefighting are we doing? And we make other changes, does it reduce the firefighting? So if we're dealing with like 6,500 errors a day, let's hope we're not, but let's say that we are, because we should be dealing with zero, right? Um, and sometimes there'll be a new one, but we should be dealing with like one or two a week, right? If we're dealing with 60 a day, we're getting into graph land instead of like respond to each one individually land. Um, those can start to, those can be super, it's super hard to see that unless you can actually count the 60 um, and understand what they were kind of all about and be dealing with them directly. So making the work visible makes it so that we've got an outage issue template, right? And it's easily trackable. It's easily, you can put it in a Kanban board. Um, you can label it, et cetera. Hopefully you've got a design culture already established doing like a wireframe first methodology or similar. There's a lot of good content about what that is here. I'll leave it, leave that as an exercise for you. Pressure mounts to make more repos and you resist. Um, more on that here. Why do we use one repo or sort of one repo? You start to invest in training, right? Uh, because you realize how important it is. Um, you can ask me in the AMA the difference between Whataburger and Starbucks. Someone who is talking regularly with customers. So this can be an engineer, but this is kind of what the product manager role is. That person is doing the prioritizing because they're the one talking to users. Um, and design and engineering are very close to that, right? And support and quality are not far behind. Um, you find you need to make product groups because you want to build cross-functional groups that consist of like, here's, here's four of them at Fleet. Reach maturity in a certain product category, make customers happier, more successful. So this is kind of our catch-all here too. Infrastructure goes without saying. Make the website wonderful. You can see you're putting together a designer, engineering manager, QA, PM, and then the developers. Same idea. Smaller group. Let not doesn't have a designer. This one does is just like two people, and I'm actually technically playing the role of engineering manager at the moment for that group. And that's product groups. You can learn a lot more in GitLab's handbook. I think we even linked to it here. Yeah, um, which that's actually a private Google Doc. Um, but if you check out GitLab's handbook, it is rich with data, covers a lot more topics than Fleet does. This is especially if you're bigger, you know, if you're 100, 200 employees or more, I would definitely, um, I would definitely look here 
uh, as well, not not just look at fleet. Other than that, you might just be able to look at fleet. Um, this has a lot more detail, and you probably don't need you know ninety percent of well, you probably don't need fifty percent of what's here when you're when you're a young company. So your continuous integration becomes more important. It's getting com complex, but it's also getting more useful. You end up turning on branch protections because you don't want someone accidentally uh, smooshing everything. You start to set the expectation of fast merge request times, and you start to measure like key performance indicators, like stats metrics, about how long these uh, change requests are staying open and how long bugs are staying open. You eventually implement a code owner's file, right? If you're uh, to to put the directly responsible individuals in charge of approving the changes to certain files, and that is its own topic uh, that we'd be happy to talk about some other time. Scaling the framework, uh, and for the sake of time here, I'm going to go pretty fast in this part and just ask uh, y'all to help me double click in the, the chat and AMA um, on topics where you're interested. So I'll probably leave out some of the stories I was going to tell. So how the framework can help or hurt. There's kind of three three places where the contributor experience provided, well, let, me, let me call it, um, let's call it the, the user land developer experience provided by sales is uh well where sales is either going to help you or hurt you right it's the built-in automatic server features so the stuff that happens automatically as part of the request life cycle you know you don't have a ton of control over that other than like writing little hooks uh, or I mean, you can write hooks you can write um you know some of the configuration lets you get in the middle with functions um, if you're using like blueprints, for example, um, you know, that would be included here as like automatic. This is stuff like your body parser, although you can, again, you can rip that out. You could put in um, formidable, right? For example. Um, so that's, that's kind of one area. And then there's, then there's the user land code. So like, what is, what is sales JS providing for you as a set of tools? Like if you open your toolbox, you're in, you crack open one of the functions that you can write in a sales app and um, what kind of things can you call in there? What is it doing automatically for you? And then the way that it does outbound integration. So talking to third-party APIs, uh, talking to the database and handling large data sets. So this is really kind of part of user land code as well. It's just, it's uh, worth addressing separately. So when we talk about automatic server features or like the request lifecycle, this is stuff like the rec and the res objects provided by Express, the body parser, which we use multi-party by default inside of Skipper. And then Skipper does some additional like stream work on top of that. Um, and the 50 milliseconds thing here is actually a, a reference to a story that I kind of covered in my 2021 talk. So I'll skip it here. Um, you can check that out on YouTube um, if you're curious about what that means. Um, the short answer is for a while, sales had a 50, 50 millisecond delay that it added to every single request, 50 milliseconds of latency. It didn't matter really. Like we didn't notice in any, any practical application. The way it got noticed is somebody uh, who wanted to find um, opportunities to contribute, pointed it out and uh, presented it to us and then uh, and we fixed it but this is an example of like that's an area where sales in the past like let's say like 2014 time frame sales was actually hurting you um the other way sales could hurt you is having a lot of features maybe that you're not using um that luckily has been mostly hammered out so uh, i'm sure that there are uh I'm sure that there are cases where um the performance from all of the extra logic inside of sales core uh, matters a lot to you and, you and you need something to go faster. But I would hazard, again, just going back to kind of our, our ground rules and where we started in this conversation today, like I would hazard that you probably don't need to, even if you're doing an app as high scale as like Walmart pay um, or let's say like a production uh, servers at Fastly, for example, I don't think you need to, um, I don't think, I don't think you need to start from the assumption that, uh, the automatic stuff in the framework will be a problem. 
user land code. This is where you're going to run into the most problems even today. It's gotten a thousand times better than before await. And there's a ton of stuff we're about to talk about that helps you. But this is where you can get in trouble. This is where if I'm reviewing sales apps code, I always find problems. So async await, use it, please just never use anything else. Uh, and if you are, remember what I'm saying right now to you, please don't uh, use that. Happy to talk about that more, or please use await always. I'm happy to talk about that more in the AMA. Error handling. Uh, so using try catch. So there's automatic try catch applied to every action helper scripts in sales, um, every policy, every route. It's designed to prevent errors from trying to respond twice. It's been tested again and again over the course of years and carefully tended to get to where all of that stuff works perfectly. And if it doesn't, let me know, please, because I've worked really hard on that um, because I want it myself because I don't trust myself to not make mistakes. We've also added something called dot intercept and dot tolerate. So dot tolerate is a way to swallow an error thoughtfully. Um, a particular kind of error, like to do sniffing, that uses a module called flavor. Um, you can use the pun probably. Intercept is like a way to catch and then rethrow an error. Again, very deliberately using declarative syntax. Um, if you've never checked those out, they are documented in the reference docs um, in the sales website, and I I recommend using them if you're. Um, if you poke around in the fleet website, which is all public and open source in the fleet repo, it's in a subfolder called website. Um, that's a sales app and it has tons of intercept and tolerate. You can just search the repo for that. Um, the repo is fleet DM slash fleet. Um, there's also several other open source apps that, that use these. Error messages and warnings. So this is an area of the framework that, uh, we spent a lot of time working on this. And then I think in the 2016 to 2018 timeframe, I, I personally spent just like even more time working on error messages and warnings. Um, we were employing a lot of more junior engineers at the time. And I found that was even more reason to do this. Um, but it also just, it just helps. It's better ergonomics and it gives you better operator experience because in your logs, when you get that 500 error, you can more easily tell what's going on. It also sets the precedent and kind of like gets your team used to seeing good error messages. So it avoids the broken windows effect, um, which give that a Google if you've never heard of that before. Um, but basically the idea that if you start to see some bad error messages, the next one you write, it's not gonna be that great either, right? Because if you're like, this is a place where we don't write great error messages. Flow control. So this is the stuff I was referring to with like if and recursion and like while loops and for loops and stuff, like all used to be way harder way better with a wait and uh, even better with sales.helpers.flow, which is included automatically in new sales apps. So the way I was, in case you've never seen this possibility, we need some, and we need to like update this better, but like for now, if you just do, uh, sales.helpers.inspects and here I'll throw a console log around it. So it gets rid of those silly characters. So yeah, this is kind of, so the, the blue ones are, uh, those are the ones that exist in this particular app uh, only. And then the ones that are white are all built in. So these are called organics. And you can see if I go to flow, here it is. I've got build, I've got dive, I've got for each, pause simultaneously for each, sim uh, simultaneously, and then until, so until is your while loop, dive is your recursion, for each is a is a await friendly for loop. And when you need a function for some reason, you can use it as a dot map as well asynchronously. So you don't have to do the for async await of or whatever. If you if you're um, I personally just not a big fan of that syntax. So I prefer to use like a function. And the nice thing about these two is that every one of these has um Dot flow dot simultaneously. So if I go, if I if I check this out and I do like get def on it, it's going to give me the definition of the helper. And I can also do dot inspect. I'll just use the same trick as before. If you have been around Node a long time, you know why this is a thing. Also, PRs would be welcome if you'd like to fix that. It's quite an easy fix, just hasn't gotten around to it yet. 
so this is kind of the usage for simultaneously used to. And again, if the fix we make that I was referring to is, is done, then you would actually just type this in. And it, it would actually output this. It doesn't right now. But uh, yeah, so you have you have kind of the usage here. You can see it's like the stencil. These are really good. There's not time to go through all of them right now. Um, highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. There's also dot retry and dot timeout, which sounds pretty much like you'd expect. Dot retry is a way to, you know, that next time that Stripe API is failing, like maybe you should do automatic retry with exponential backoff. And all you have to do for that is to do, um, you know, sales.helpers. HTTP dot get whatever. So there's me hitting example.com, right? But let's say I hit example two.com. That's probably not a real thing, right? Let's say. Oh, well, apparently it is. Let's try example like a big crazy number. All right, so it failed, right? But if I add dot retry, now it's going to retry again and again with back with exponential back off. Every time it's like, that's not a real domain. That's not a real domain. That's not a real domain. But we get all that for free, which is pretty cool. Just don't ever do retry on a non-item potent API. So don't do it for like send email because you might have nasty surprises when you send like five of the same email. Timeout is very similar kind of stability related thing to be able to handle uh, when... You, this is configurable. You can also configure the, the exponential back off, but for timeouts, um, you can configure how long you want it to wait before giving up. Um, and then that gives you a special, easily negotiable error, um, which you can then use intercept or tolerate to handle as you like, or use the try catch however you want. But these are the easiest way because you can chain these on. Some other changes, middleware became routes and uh, routes and policies and sales is one of the first things that we did in 2012. I think this was really mostly when it was just me. Um, Express middleware is cool, but routes and policies were a higher level um, that really are pretty transformative in the way that you work as a team, especially in the sales app. Actions too is the next logical step of that. And for reasons we've already talked about, kind of takes that to the whole next level, um, please switch to Actions 2 if you haven't already. It's going to change your change your life. Um, yeah, and if you're curious about why routes and policies are so much better than just using raw middleware, um, Ezra actually covers that in his like, five-minute talk that we talked about earlier. Um, he does a, a great job explaining it. We also converted services into helpers for much the same reason. It provides more structure. It makes every helper now supports timeout. Every helper supports retry automatically. Every helper supports auto handling try catch within its implementation. Every helper supports intercept and tolerate. Every helper supports async await automatically. Every helper forces you to put inputs and exits declaratively specified. Every helper is designed to save you from yourself, improve the developer experience and scale more safely and be scalable and safe and stable by default. And boring. So uh, user land code also, we talked a little bit about Parley before I'm gonna rush through some of this. Uh, we did not talk about cloud SDK much, but this is the thing that lets you in the browser do stuff like, I'll just pick on fleetdm.com because it's right here. I think I even have cloud, right? So like, these are all of my endpoints. And if you're someone who's been around long enough to know what a WSDL is, you can think of this as like a, like a WSDL that's actually nice. Um, and this automatically gives you basically helper style usage, but instead of doing sales.helpers, you're just doing this, um, works exactly the same way. Um, if you are not using that aspect of Parasales yet, you can also just use this inside of React or in vanilla view, or you can use it in Angular. You can use it in any framework you want. This piece is designed to be pulled out separately. So, uh, yeah, recommend checking that out. Um, that's what cloud SDK is. Um, and if you want to follow up on that, it's not the most well-documented corner of the framework, um, but in a newly generated sales app, if you were to check out the scripts folder, there's this script called rebuild cloud SDK. And if you just kind of have a scan through it, it's like 130 lines of code. It's all pretty well commented. Um, you'll see exactly what it does and how it works.
Cool. And then databases, integrations, and large data sets. The I'm gonna I'm gonna rush this a little bit, but I'll just point out that if you've got a slow, if you've got a slow route, the first place to check is make sure you're not overwhelming RAM, right? So count uh count the size, and I'm mentioning O of N here. So if you if you are familiar with big O notation, that'll make sense. If not, just ignore it. What I'm talking about is basically like loading too many records from the database into memory at once. So if you have something, you know, you started with 10 users and now you have 100,000, loading all 100,000 of those into memory is going to be a problem. Or if you have 10 users and now you have uh, 1,000 users, if every user has 10,000 associated records and you're populating all of those, that's the same situation. So I would say this is the most, and what, this is not just sales, this is any framework. This is the most common like problem area that you can get into with scalability in code. And it's not even scalability from traffic. It's really scalability of just like, we didn't plan for that data set to be that big and now it's causing problems. So I would call that kind of the uh, bigger than expected data set problem. The way to solve that is to use cursors and potentially native queries, but a lot of times you can just use a cursor. And by that, I just mean the stream method. Um, and that's documented in the in the sales docs. You can search for it and you'll see what I mean. Pretty easy to use. Don't be intimidated by it. It is not a Node.js stream. It is much, much easier. Um, and supports async await, all those things. The other thing is counting the number of times you see the word await. So because await can be inside of loops, this can be an area that really slows down your um, slows down your app. And really, it adds latency. It'll slow down one particular action. Um, and the places you normally see this is in calls to third-party APIs through HTTP uh, requests or using wireline to talk to the database. Just as an example, uh, Eric Shaw on the sales core team recently optimized um, the, that dashboard we've been looking at. And uh, basically, the, the the approach that he took there was First, fix the infinities. So fix the things that just are never going to work. Like what is, all, it goes back to the user experience. Like how long am I going to have to wait? If, if I have to wait 10 seconds to load the homepage, it's not going to work, right? If I have to wait 10 seconds for a CSV export, that's probably fine, right? Maybe we add a little message in the UI or good. Um, that relentless prioritization is what was what you can do instead of the pissing contest, right? Um, and will allow you to solve problems like this in a couple of days with minimal distraction. And this is just uh, this code here. I'll flash on the screen for a bit to give you a sense of uh, of some of the stuff that came up. So here you go. So now paginate over software items in the fleet API processing as we go along. This is to avoid overflowing RAM on the server in the antagonistic case where there are bukus of vulnerabilities for some reason. And you can see there's a lot of preventative measures here, right? Like we're adding for every API call we make, we're we're adding a link to the docs for it. Why? Because we have more than more than a handful of people on the team. Somebody that's never seen this before is very likely to come in here. And we all know how forgetful we are. So this is a way to make it so that like, I could be on two hours of sleep and drunk and I could still find my way around this, this code file, right? So prioritizing scale, uh, why bother, when bother? Focus on usability. If it's unusable, that means a bug. So just think of the CSV thing that we were just talking about. Unusable means bug, bugs first, fix bugs first always, no matter what, then everything else. Stop what you're doing, fix the bug first, even just that one bug. Or document it as expected behavior and take ownership of it as part of your product, but nothing in the middle. Then dog food it. When you use something yourself, it has to work. You prioritize fixes and you focus on what actually matters for whatever practical goal you're aiming to achieve. So building a, a good product, uh, getting people to use it, driving money, whatever that is, uh, or just getting your product into the hands of people who need it and satisfying some kind of like higher level goal, like making the world's monitoring software open source. 
get it out into the world. Uh, community and customers will help you find a lot more holes. And the sooner you do that, the better that is going to be for your whole project. You're going to develop a process to notice and prioritize and fix those holes. Um, and the sales community has absolutely done that. So I'll just kind of also mention uh, open source takes that to a whole other level. Um, but that's a topic for another talk. So I also have an announcement. Um, we're at the end of the kind of scheduled programming here. And speaking of open source and community, um, you'll notice this is the third year in a row where Kelvin has put on SalesConf, done a great job. Um, Kelvin's also been helping out the sales framework in lots of other ways, running the sales casts um, uh, community and all the content around that. He's also been working on some much, much more labor intensive and uh, um, well, I'd say like I mean, SalesCast is pretty exciting, but I'd say he's working on some pretty exciting stuff um, called Shipwright, which he'll talk more about, but it has to do with the asset pipeline in sales. Uh, right now, we're still on Grunt. And you can rip that out and put whatever you want, but what we provide by default in sales matters a lot. The reality is pretty much anyone using that, myself included, and the teams that I've worked with just doesn't care and it's been good enough, right? But recognize that it, it can feel less good to have something older for a component of the framework. And um, Kelvin has been super, uh, super collaborative super helpful and patient with me about the timeline for it and has really been running with it on his own. Uh, we've been going back and forth and uh, really stoked about what's in ship right. And I'll let him tell the details. Um, the short story there is it will be backwards compatible. Uh, so you'll still be able to use Grunt if you want, or if you switch to it, you should have everything still continue to work because again, Grunt was mostly transparent. If you were using custom Grunt tasks, you're gonna have to re-implement those. Um, but, uh, yeah, coming, coming soon. I'll, I'll let him tell you more, but that's just one example of the kind of thing that Kelvin has been contributing and will continue to contribute to sales. And what I would like to do is announce him as lead maintainer of sales. So I will always be the benevolent dictator for life. In case, unless something comes up where I just can't, you know, I'm by, uh, I'm hurt or I'm in an accident, whatever, right? Um, don't get any ideas, Kelvin. Just kidding. Uh, I have never felt as good about uh, bringing someone on in this capacity um, ever out of anyone I've not I've met. Um, Kelvin, sometimes I sort of uh, see, and you, I've never told you this, but I sort of see you as a a kindred spirit on the other side of the globe. I find it so, uh, it's like we're doppelgangers sometimes. Um, and I think philosophically and like uh, just attitude wise, uh, has Kelvin has really shaped the community around SalesCast and the work he's done um, exactly in the way that I would have wanted. Um, and so I think it's time for him to, to, to step up and, uh, um, really get that title officially. Um, and that's going to mean he'll be doing a lot more work on sales itself, um, the docs, et cetera. We probably have a few projects in mind. Shipwright's kind of the, the highest value, lowest hanging fruit. And Kelvin's also going to be talking about the boring stack in the next couple of days, which, uh, which I think is really, really interesting and very, very different from what JavaScript's open source frameworks are known for. Um, so really looking forward to hearing more from him on that. And I'll just add the caveat that I am not going anywhere. I continue to use sales very actively. I use it with more big name projects than I did back in the day. Um, I will be around, but I am also very time strapped right now in my other role. So uh, I, will be a, I will be a control. I will be a, a collaborator. Um, and I'll be here for our flagship customers. Um, but yeah, Kelvin will be the uh, the new lead maintainer of sales. Um, and, the, and the person who, or the two people who held that kind of title before Rachel Shaw and, and Eric Shaw, 
um, my wife and brother-in-law respectively have done amazing work. We'll continue to be involved as well. Um, but they have a similar problem to, to me right now where they're, they're tied up in, in other work, um, parenting, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, this, the timing couldn't have been better. Um, I think Kelvin is going to be able to take this to a whole other level. So I'm just, I'm like really, really genuinely excited about this. Um, uh, and start crying. So I would love to answer any questions you have about that or anything else we've talked about today in the live chat in the AMA, which is like in two hours. So I'm going to go try to sleep for a little while. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to talk to y'all. So just to recap, what do we talk about today other than the announcement? What is scale? A journey in four dimensions. Latency, concurrency, stability, and maintainability. Sales is scalable by default. That's the design ambition and the reality. You measure scalability by benchmarking, low testing, or saying YOLO and saying screw it and not measuring it at all. What scaling is actually like is a series of bottlenecks and learnings. They can get better the next time you do them, but never totally go away. Scaling sales apps consist of a lot of different ways the framework can help or hurt you. And I would argue it's been more helpful than hurtful since the very beginning. Otherwise, I never would have used it and my teams never would have been successful with it. But I can say that it is vastly more helpful than hurting now. Uh, so after 10 years, it's uh, and there's a lot, a lot of love. Um, you know, there are still a few areas where I think we, we hurt more than we help. But I think if you look at the net, um, I think sales is a revelatory experience versus not using it. Um, and uh, would love to would love to hear from you where that's not true. But um, in my experience and in the teams I've worked with, it's been a it's been a pretty massive game changer in terms of productivity and uh, and let's just say scalability in all the four dimensions. And then prioritizing scale, we covered kind of why bother with this and, and when um, and some examples. So that's it. That's sales at scale. I'm Mike McNeil. I'm the CEO of Fleet. And I'll just add a quick plug. So Fleet is an open source platform for security and IT teams with thousands of computers. It works with AWS, custom data centers, custom IoT devices, Coke machines, I don't know, smart anything you want, fish farms, uh, <laughs> nuclear power plants, et cetera, it can run in an air-gapped environment. It's 100% open source, and the paid features are also source available, just like GitLab. Um, and it is uh, air-gap friendly for, for folks who need that. Um, you can deploy it yourself, or Fleet will host it for you. And what it does is help you uh, replace um, other solutions you might be using for Kind of separate solutions for managing vulnerabilities like we talked about today uh, or um, managing hundreds or thousands of laptops for your team or even just 10 laptops for your team right um, and it kind of gets all that into one open source product and the uh, kind of the vision there is that we can all have a future where our grandchildren are monitored by open source software um, as opposed to the alternative and that's pretty much it about Fleet. I'm also the creator and BDFL for sales. I will be here uh, long-term and uh, again, super excited to have uh, Kelvin stepping into the, into the role of Fleet Maintainer. If you're curious about the artwork you've seen, uh, the sales and the Fleet artwork are by Michael Thomas. You can check out his portfolio and some other kind of cool pictures there. Um, and then there's my, my contact info. Also, just to point it out, the handbook links we've been looking at are, are all in the Fleet DM Company handbook. It's all public. Um, again, inspired by GitLab here, really, and I'm just trying to kind of pass the favor on um, to the next generation of people starting, um, starting businesses and especially starting open core companies with open source software. I think all software will be open source eventually. So thanks for the time and uh, have fun at the rest of the conference. I think we have some really, really exciting ones this time. And this is our first sales comp with a Node.js technical steering committee member. So uh, thanks, Mateo, for, uh, for hanging out with us.